Hello, Hosh Gilgenes, everyone. I want every, anybody who's having who's celebrating Ramadan today, have a happy Ramadan. Um, I'm really happy that you guys can make it to our sixth edition of the Ancient Wonders Lecture Series. My name is Harper, and I'm a public relations assistant at the Eunice Emory Institute in Washington, D.C. And today I'll be joined by Dr. Felix Pearson. Um, so now let me explain a few things about the Eunice Emory Institute and what it is that we do here. The Eunice Emory Institute is a Turkish cultural center with 60 locations around the world. The Institute teaches people about Turkey and its history, language, and culture through events and programs like concerts, exhibitions, and talks like this one. Um, in the past, some of our events included hosting a concert headlined by a folk music band, The Secret Trio, and an exhibition on auto of Ottoman uh, photographs from the personal collection of the Sultan, and Turkish culinary night nights with famous Turkish chefs like Yunus Emre Akor. Every year, our language classes and events reach hundreds, if not thousands of people in the US and the Yunus Emory Institute hopes that by engaging in cultural diplomacy through subcategories like music, art, culinary, and science diplomacy, it can bring people in Turkey and around the world closer together to create a more harmonious future. So let's get into what we have planned for today. Um, for today's program, we'll be hearing about the ancient settlement of Pergamon with Dr. Pearson. And once he concludes his lecture, we will jump right into the Q&A session where you'll have the opportunity to ask him some questions. Just some ground rules before we begin is that everyone will remain muted while Dr. Pearson is speaking. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box or wait until our Q&A session begins at the end of the lecture. I'll be reading your questions aloud today to Dr. Pearson, and I'll have my fellow public relations assistant, Matt, monitor the chat box here. Um, so now a little bit about our speaker today. Dr. Pearson is a distinguished expert in archeology span and is the director of the Istanbul branch of the German Archeological Institute. He is also currently the director of the Pergamon Excavations, where he has written dozens of publications as he continues to work extensively at the site. Dr. Pearson is no stranger to speaking about his research because he has taught at Istanbul University and Leipzig University, where he became honorary professor of classical archaeology in 2010. He is a corresponding member of the Archaeological Institute of America, a member of several different editorial boards, and the editor of various periodicals and series. So now, without further ado, I'm going to let Dr. Pearson take it away and show you what makes the Pergamon archaeological site so incredible and awe-inspiring. Um, welcome, Dr. Pearson. We're excited to get started today. Yeah, hello, and Iyakshamla from Istanbul. Um, many thanks to the Yunus Emre Institute for the invitation and the opportunity to talk about our work, and thanks to Harper Bay for the kind introduction. I will share my screen with you, just a second. Okay, everything seems to work. Yes, excellent. So, um, the aim of my lecture today is to uh, take you to a uh, on today's Bergama in the province of Izmir at the western coast of Turkey, which is, as you can see on my first slide, since 2009, also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, Pergamon uh, has a long and very interesting history of about 4,000 years. And of course, in this lecture, I can only illustrate some aspects which are related to our current archaeological work there. So I will try to combine a journey through, let's say, parts of Bergamas, Pergamon's history with some information about our recent work there. And um, everything will be at least a bit under the aspect of human environment interaction, which is a particular focus of our current research today. So, just check. okay. Um, the Pergamon excavation is in itself, let's say, 
uh, his, uh, has a certain history, a long history for an excavation project. We started um, ago and um, uh, a couple of years earlier, um, we celebrated our 140 years uh, anniversary of the excavation uh, and you can see here uh, the respective ceremony on the palestra of the uh, gymnasium of Pergamon. Uh, in the occasion of this celebration we also highlighted some aspects of the excavation history uh, on site in order to make it for the visitors also understandable that um, an excavation project and an archaeological site such as Pergamon is not just giving information about um, settlement the people who live there in antiquity, but um, also has an interesting history itself, which tells a and changing methodolo methodologies. And what you see here is a part of the old excavation railway which was installed in the early in the late 19th early 20th history uh, 20th century in order to carry away large amounts of debris uh, from the old excavation these um, let's say early 19th century excavations um, worked with a large workforce lots of earth was removed in a relatively short time and um, if you want to have a look at archaeology uh, as, a, uh, as a field technique, um, you might get the impression that in the course of time, it gets slower and slower. Yeah. Today, we work with much less uh, workmen and excavation techniques has improved a lot earth away anymore. Um, but we thought, thought that this is an interesting topic to point uh, the visitors to. And uh, as everywhere in the site, also this point is illustrated with an information tabloid in three languages, Turkish, English, and German. Today, uh, Pergamon excavation is a big uh, Turkish, German, and international project during our three-month summer campaigns. There are about 100 members of the academic stuff, starting from students to uh, professors from various universities. We have um, um, substantial local workforce consisting of workers and experts and uh, people who are working in the excavation house and in the kitchen. Um, our team is not just working in Pergamon itself, but also in the surrounding, as you can see here in this uh, picture top right. And we work day and night. At the evening, uh, the colleagues are sitting in the uh, computer room where all the information from the various projects are integrated in one database. All this is thanks to the permission by the Ministry of Culture and Tourism of the Republic of Turkey. Um, and I'm very grateful for this permission and for their trust and also for the support of our international project. Um, well, I already mentioned that Pergamon is situated at the Aegean coast of Turkey, about um, one and a half hours drive north of Izmir. Um, in a valley, which you can see on this map here. Uh, today, it's the Bakırçay in antiquity. This river here was called the Kaikos. And Pergamon itself is not uh, located directly at the sea, but in a strategically very advantageous position, quite in the center of this valley, on an about a 330 meter high mound, which you can see here in a 3D uh, reconstruction for the Hellenistic phase. So the city basically used this natural mound as a city hill. Our journey through the history of Pergamon starts in the seventh millennium BC. Um, these are the oldest settlement traces we know so far from this valley but new discoveries point uh, actually, to, 
actually to a much, much earlier settlement of this entire um, region here. At Pergamon itself, also on the city hill of Pergamon, um, human activity can only be traced uh, considerably later in the second millennium BC in the Bronze Age. And it seems that Pergamon was a kind of fortified settlement in the Bronze Age. But um, we shouldn't expect too much in this period. The most uh, important place seems to be a small tepe today called Deemen Tepe, more in the western part of the um, uh, of the river basin of the Caicos, and uh, this is a quite typical uh, settlement location for this period. Um, I make quite big steps in time and already. Uh, arrive here at the um, uh, uh, at the period of the so-called Achaemenid rule of the rule of the Persian dynasty in Asia Minor, the sixth to fourth century BCE. Um, until a few years ago, there wasn't hardly any knowledge, any <coughs> archaeological knowledge about this period. Only some written sources. But our archaeological surveys in the last 10 to 15 years have revealed many new information. I only want to show two examples marked on the map here. Um, one example is the so-called Tashdam Tepe necropolis, which consists of rock-cut graves in house form here and a very interesting um, tumulus, a grave mound with a double-story grave chamber, which is Quite a quite unusual feature. Unfortunately, um, these graves are in most of the cases already robbed, uh, sometimes in ancient times, sometimes unfortunately, uh, unfortunately quite recently. But we were still able to date this construction to the fourth century BC. Um, another very interesting uh, finding was the so-called Zindan Kayase located here, which is a fortified uh, hilltop or rock top settlement where uh, we have to imagine a so-called dynast. dynast. Uh, these dynasts were kind of local rulers uh, in very small territories who somehow depended uh, on the Persian king. Yeah? And uh, both the necropolis and the graves, which I've shown to you before, and the Zindan Kayase can be somehow related to this ruling class of the Persian period. Um, then we have the fourth century BCE, the so-called late classical period, which also for a long time seemed to be a kind of enigma for um, the history of Pergamon, it was assumed that, let's say, before the Hellenistic period, Pergamon didn't play a big role as a polis, as a city. But uh, new observations point to a different direction, telling us that already in the late 4th century, Pergamon must have been a city of a certain importance with the temple of Athena here and a city wall which had been attributed to um, uh, to the third century, but we think now it's still in the late classical period and before uh, Alexander the Great completely changed the history of the Eastern Mediterranean. And Alexander the Great is an important figure for Pergamon's history uh, too, since on his way to the East, he, le he left one of his concubines, Barzine, together with the son Heracles, on the top of the fortified um, settlement of Pergamon, which had probably in the 4th century, we see already here, a city wall. And um, these, let's say, very prominent uh, inhabitants in the late 4th century uh, BC can also be somehow linked with the erection of this temple. The kind of founding father of Pergamon in sense of a Hellenistic capital, however, is another historical person, Philetairos, 
whom you can see here on a later coin from the third century BC. Philisiros is quite a fascinating historical figure. He was a general of Lysimachos, and Lysimachos himself was a general of Alexander the Great, and was uh, belonged to the first generation of the so-called diadochs, the followers of Alexander the Great, uh, between whom the um, empire of Alexander was divided. And in the part which was ruled by Lysimachos, um, the, the treasure, the war treasure of Lysimachos, which consisted of huge amounts of silver, were stored on the hilltop of Pergamon, which was obviously regarded as a particularly secure location, and the guard of the treasury was Philetairos. But Philetairos was a clever politician, and he understood in the early 3rd century BCE that, let's say, the power of Lysimachos was waning, and the new rising star was Zeleukos and the Seleucid Empire, so he made himself somehow independent, but also somehow under, let's say, the umbrella, under the protection of the Seleucids. And he didn't call himself king, although he was the founder of the Attalid dynasty, but it was also two generations later when the first Attalid, uh, Atalos I, called himself king and minted coins with the portrait of Philetairos. Um, for several uh, generations of archaeologists, it was thought that basically Philetairos re-founded the city of Pergamon. But uh, more recent um, research shows that um, he was reluctant in, let's say, pretending too much. Obviously, the extra-urban sanctuary of Demeter can be related to um, Philetairos and a few other building activities uh, in places in the surroundings of Pergamon, but the city uh, itself obviously didn't change considerably under his rule, as far as we can say so far. Um, this changed under the already mentioned Atalos I, the first Attalid who took the title of Basileus, king in the late third century BC. And um, he was the one who started for the first time with a kind of Hellenistic building program in the city. I don't want to describe this program further, but just mention one finding we did in 2010, uh, a grave mount, a tumulus on a hill north to the city hill of Pergamon. Here's the city hill of Pergamon and the grave mount I'm talking about is over here. And um, what we found there was uh, a tumulus with a grave chamber, unfortunately already robbed, but we could find remains of the skeleton of a about 60, 70 year old male individual, or so quite old for this period, um, who was buried in a grave chamber under the floor, but nevertheless, the illegal excavators found the burial. But fortunately, they left at least some pottery for us to date the grave chamber to the second half of the third century BC. Um, it's architecturally, it's very well made. It's the first kind of vaulting um, we find in Pergamon. Uh, and the quality of the architecture and the kind of the architecture uh, has many parallels in other building projects of Atalos I. So, most probably it's not the burial of the king himself, but of somebody important from his court. Uh, however, the Pergamon as we know it, and as it's famous in classical archeology, span and I show here um, a very uh, a kind of imaginary stimulating uh, reconstruction done by the German architect Richard Bohn in the early 20th century with the Temple of Athena, which I've already mentioned, with the great altar of Zeus, with the theater, the theater terrace, and with the Roman edition of the Temple of Trajan here. This Pergamon developed uh, in the 2nd century BC, 
particular under the rule of Eumenes II, which you can see here on one coin. Eumenes II was clearly uh, the most powerful ruler of the Attalid family. And um, uh, under his reign, the territory of Pergamon as a Hellenistic territorial state reached its largest intentions covering approximately the western half of Anatolia of modern Turkey from the coast to Ankara. Um, how could Eumenes manage uh, to increase his territory so much? He again was a clever politician, a good diplomat, and he understood very soon that the new superpower in the Mediterranean was Rome. And he went into an alliance with Rome and it was basically thanks to this alliance and thanks of victories of this alliance over the Seleucids and other enemies that from about um, 190, 180 BCE, uh, Eumenes got this huge um, territory. Um, and he was also a very active builder in the city, a patron of building activities together with his brother, um, Atalos II. And I show you again here um, a schematic map of the city hill of Pergamon with the uh, plateau on top with the great altar of Zeus, the Athena temple, the theater terrace, and the upper agora. Here we have living quarters, and then we have in the middle part of the city hill, the huge gymnasium. Um, all this is surrounded by a city wall shown here in red, which encloses an area of about 90 hectares. And everything which is shown on the map here in red can be attributed to Eumenes II and his brother Atalos. Um, the second. Also, the extension of the city to uh, 90 hectares from the former um, 28 hectares can be attributed to Eumenes. Um, however, it's interesting to note from the point of settlement history that although a rather large area was surrounded by a fortification wall, only parts of these fortified area was actually settled up. So what is marked here in red was uh, the core of the settlement area of the city in the second century BC under Eumenes II. He also built then the huge gymnasium, so he enlarged the city beyond this area. And there are some spots, let's say, of settlements um, in this huge fortified area, but uh, under the period of the Attalids, we still have to imagine this area as not completely settled up, but rather void. Perhaps it was used for agricultural purposes. There might have been single buildings. Um, you have to imagine that the Hellenistic period was a very unsecure time. There were often uh, let's say enemies getting even into the closer territory so there was uh, a need for the rural population um, to let's say hide behind walls and we can imagine that all this happened in this area here. It was only in the first century BCE so after the end of the Attalid rule that this um, situation concerning the urban development changed profoundly. The first century BCE used to be a kind of dark age in Pergamon's history, but we were able to shed some more light on this very interesting period of transformation. In 133 BC, a very interesting uh, kind of act in history happened in the sense that um, Atalos III, the last king, uh, the last ruler from the Attalid dynasty, inherited it, the, uh, the reign of Pergamon to the Romans. At the end, that was a consequence um, of many decades of history, which actually showed, I mentioned that, that Pergamon was the new superpower. And the Pergamon, the Romans took the reign of Pergamon and made it their province of Asia. 
And this led to several changes, um, at, for instance, to a concentration of people in big cities. Um, this had many reasons, um, and I don't have the time to elaborate on this here. But um, if you look at this building, for instance, which is located here on the western slope of the city, or the so-called X building, when we um, did some uh, stratigraphic excavations there, we could show that there was um, quite a big amount of pottery already from the second century BCE, but the building itself stems from the first century BCE. And that's the observation that we can make both on the western and on the eastern slope, that all the buildings we have there are not older than the first century BCE. Yeah? This goes also for the lower agora, the lower marketplace shown here. Um, before I go in more details about that, um, I want briefly draw your attention uh, again to the funeral culture, to the necropolis. Um, I showed already one tumulus um, dating to the period of Atalos I, um, but the hugest tumulus and the most, let's say, interesting monument, we have a grave monument in Pergamon, is the Yima Tepe here with a diameter of about 158 meters, a height of 30 meters, and due to the fact that the entire earth uh, the tumulus was uh, built from was taken from this ditch here, it uh, appears even more monumental. And the question was, of course, who is buried in this tumulus? Um, and already the early German excavators of the early 20th century, they tried to find a grave ch chamber using tunnels from mining techniques, but weren't able to find let's say, anything of this kind inside the grave mount. And we started with a new research project on the tumulus, which uses geophysical um, methodologies combined with excavations in the outside of the tumulus. And our aim was, was not, let's say, to find and to open a grave chamber, because the Yima Tepe is such an important monument for Pergamon that... Um, uh, you probably uh, have to take away more or less the entire mount in order to make a proper modern excavation of such a grave chamber. And this is, of course, beyond imagination. Yeah, This monument has, has to be preserved as it is, but at least we try to understand it a bit better. So we started to work on the ring wall, which surrounds the tumulus. Here you see in photograph from about uh, 1910, showing the old excavation. This is the same situation today. And we, here, there's an interesting kind of um, small podium in front of this round wall. And behind this podium, we could trace a ramp leading up to the tumulus. The interpretation is difficult, but uh, there's a a PhD project going on at the moment about it, so we will wait for the results of the young colleague. Um, another interesting finding we made during this excavation concerns the construction technique of the tumulus. So heaping up a 30 meter or more than 30 meter high tumulus is not just, let's say, accumulating earth, but uh, of course this has to be planned, there have to be kind of uh, statical um, considerations have to be made. And what we found is that just behind the crepice, seven, we could detect several rows. You can see them here better. Um, also kind of little walls or stone settings of pebbles, which were probably made both, let's say, to organize the filling process and to st stabilize the filling. Yeah, that's an interesting observation, not very often made in Tumuli, um, but thanks to our excavation technique and documentation technique, we could show this quite well. And uh, this is now also waiting for further interpretation. Particularly important was the geophysical prospection. That means that with, with various kinds of radar, seismic, 
electric and other techniques, we try to look into the hill without excavating it. And this was done by colleagues from Kiel University who worked together with Izmit Kojeli uh, University. And there were big teams of students and scholars who worked at this very difficult site for um, geophysical prospection. And here you see an interesting tool which they have invented for the um, radar prospection on such a huge hill. Uh, you can see here, um, the colleagues were able to distinguish various layers and phases of Earth, which show us the process of the accumulation of Earth at the Yima Tepe, tepe probably in various phases. And these schematic drawing here show various, let's say, anomalies or seismic points of interest in the center of the tumulus, uh, which are potential built structures. This has now all been published in uh, specialized papers, and we are very, look, very much looking forward to the discussion uh, of the scientific community concerning these findings. So let's turn back to Pergamon. The Hima Tepe is situated just uh, south. And you uh, might remember that I said that the first century BCE was a kind, is not regarded by us anymore as a dark age of Pergamon settlement history, but a quite crucial age where probably many people from the countryside of Pergamon were settled in the city itself perhaps by a certain pressure of the Roman rulers, but there might have been many other reasons. And one trace they left, and we could discover in our surveys of the eastern and the western slope in the last couple of years, are so-called rock-cut sanctuaries. These are sanctuaries which do not consist of great temples, but which use very spectacular natural settings uh, such as here on the northeastern slope of the city hill, where uh, the terrain looks rather natural with many rocks. And what we found there are such kind of worked rocks, like the so-called big um, uh, rock cut sanctuary with several terraces, where, for instance, here there was a podium for a statue, and here is another sanctuary a bit higher up, the so-called Grotto Sanctuary, where two natural caves were artific artificially modified into grottos. Buildings were set in front of it, and this was also used as a cult area. And from one of the two caves or grottos, we could find the entire inventory of the sanctuary because the sanctuary probably was destroyed by an earthquake at about the year zero. And then everything was thrown into the grotto. So we have kind of votive objects like this beautiful depiction of Dionysus and Ariadne, small altars, terracottas, lots of oil lamps, and particularly interesting um, complete sets of dishes, pottery dishes, which were obviously used by the cult community who celebrated in, these, in this natural sanctuary. And um, the natural sanctuary are a very interesting aspect of the religious life of the city and of the sacred topography of Pergamon, because they, they are, of course, a sharp contrast to the very rich uh, official sanctuaries like the uh, sanctuary of Athena, which are high quality of architecture, the use of lots of marbles, uh, statuary, and so on, while the um, rock cut sanctuary, the grotto sanctuary here with this deep cave where all the material was found, looks, let's say, very natural, yeah, like not belonging to the city, but rather to the countryside. But there was obviously a need in the first century BC to get 
the countryside, the nature, somehow into the city and make it part of the religious life. And another fascinating aspect is that this kind of natural sanctuaries, we know from the surroundings of Pergamon as real kind of natural countryside sanctuaries, and suddenly they appear in the city. But they don't stay for long. They are, all these natural sanctuaries in the cities are a phenomenon of the first century BC, this fascinating period of transformation of city space. And we imagine that this has something to do with new settlers arriving from the countryside and a certain period of transformation. That's our interpretation at the moment. So if we look at this um, very illustrative 3D visualization of Pergamon, which however includes all the knowledge of our research, um, we see here Pergamon in the state of the second century CE, so the Roman Empire, where we will turn now to. But you have to imagine that uh, here is the city of hall of the second century, city wall of the second century BCE from Oemenes II. And only in the first century CE, slowly all these hills were built up. Yeah? And in between there were these natural sanctuaries like here and over there, for instance. So we will leave now the Hellenistic period and the transformation period, and we will turn now to the Roman uh, imperial um, period. And I will try to give you at least some very brief insights. Um, here is a view from the Temple of Trajan down to the lower city, uh, which extended in the Roman time. And we will try to find out more about this lower city in the next couple of years. Um, this is all part of a 12-year research project on the transformation of the Pergamon microregion, um, which attempts to understand Pergamon and its countryside as a socio-ecological entity. So to understand human environment relation in a certain micro area from very, very different aspects, such as, let's say, um, quality of life and demography health of the inhabitants, but also how resources are used, such as building material, and all this comes together then in a social ecological model, which I will mention at the end. Um, we started with this project in 2019, and I can give you only some very superficial uh, insights. Here you see again the city hill of Pergamon. Here is the big Yima Tepe we have seen before. Here the famous sanctuary of Asclepios. And in our current reconstruction, the area marked here in green was settled from the late first century CE onwards. And in less than 100 years, the size of the city doubled. Yeah? And this must have led, of course, to massive change also in the micro region because there was a completely new demand for food resources and other things. And it was not just settled, there was also a huge building program going on consisting out of an amphitheater, a stadium, urban residences and a theater in this area here and many more uh, big public buildings of the Roman imperial age. Um, I just want to show you the amphitheater as one example. The amphitheater of Pergamon is a famous monument because it's one of the very few amphitheaters we have in the Eastern Mediterranean. It has never been studied in detail so far, and we have now started a new research project with a PhD project by a Turkish colleague, Isan Yenaolu. Um, who is doing his PhD at Berlin and working on this particular monument. Um, this architectural research of the amphitheater is combined with arch archaeological trenches. And I just show you two examples. One trench discovered the, um, um, the border wall 
of the arena, also in the arena, the gladiatorial games and all these other things took place. And there was a wall with niches who closed the arena against the rows of seats for the audience. And we even found parts of the floor of the arena shown here, where we could find lots of cleats or shoe nails. And also in the arena, that's very interesting, we found remains of a basin, which could be closed up and ponded, so to collect water, because a natural stream was running through the arena. And this was probably made to stage kind of sea battles and other things. And in a later period, probably already after the use of the amphitheater for spectacles, a new basin was made then for economic purposes. We leave now Pergamon, and uh, I want to give you at least some very brief impressions from Pergamon's countryside, um, because in antiquity, you can never understand a city without looking at the countryside. And also in modern urban studies, the city-countryside relation becomes more and more important. And um, we do this by archaeological surveys, which are combined with interviews with the local population because they know uh, their territory, of course, best and are our most important source of information for ancient sites. This is done by my colleague Murat Tozan, an ancient historian from Izmir, who is here talking to villagers in various Shaihanas, tea houses. Um, the area we have studied so far starts from Pergamon and goes to the coast. And um, all the blue dots you see here are settlements from the Roman period. Just to give you one example how the results of such surveys look. And um, to give you an idea about one of the sites, a particularly interesting one, I take you to this site here, which is at the, let's say, at the, uh, at the foothills of the Junsta Mountains, just where the basin of the Bakirchai, the Kaikos, starts. And these are typical survey finds, so we do not excavate there. We only work on the surveys. Surface, for instance, in these wonderful olive um, yard here. And we find their pottery, and this map here shows various pottery concentrations combined with geophysical prospections. And they tell us that at this place, there must have been a huge and very rich building from the Roman imperial age up to the early Byzantine period. And we were able to find pieces of marble architecture there, and not small marble architecture, but as you can see in the reconstruction, here's the piece we found there, um, quite huge, very representative architecture, probably belonging to a huge Roman villa who was situated in this area and exploited the area for agricultural purposes. Um, and uh, in order to bring all these various information about Pergamon and about the microregion together, we are slowly building up a so-called socio-ecological model, which will help us to understand better how the city depended on the countryside and vice versa, how this developed. This includes also written sources, of course, like uh, the famous physician Galen, uh, who is an important uh, Scalen from Pergamon from the second century AD, who is an important source and tells us, for instance, the number of uh, inhabitants of Pergamon for the second century CE, which is about, if you calculate children and slaves, also 180,000. But they didn't only live in the city, but also in the rural territory of the city, which was also part of a city space in antiquity. And one of our first question was, is this territory enough? to feed all the people who lived in the city. And we combined information from our surveys and from other studies to model various scenarios, how much land is needed in order to feed this population. And the result is that the 
uh, rural territory of Pergamon, um, which actually belonged to the city, but also a slightly larger area where you could walk within two days, is not enough to feed the population. Only if you enlarge the territory further, Pergamon could be fed by what was cultivated in this area. But it's much more probable that at least Roman imperial Pergamon, the big Roman metropolis, depended also on supply from regional and interregional networks. But these are only first steps, and we will try to make this model more and more detailed in order to stand this human and environment act interaction on a micro-regional scale. Before I finish, I want to give you at least some very brief impressions of another very important part of our work, which is uh, preservation of the cultural heritage. Um, as archaeologists and building historians, um, of course, we have a big responsibility that um, the objects of our research are preserved for next generations. And this can only be done on the basis of uh, academic archaeological knowledge, yeah? because only if you understand a building, you are able to uh, restore it and present it uh, properly. And uh, I take as an example, the so-called Red Hall, which you can say here in the old city of Pergamon, here is the city hill, um, which is a huge century, uh, sanctuary from the uh, Roman imperial period, a huge, huge complex as big as some of the imperial fora at Rome itself, consisting of a central basilica, the so-called Kizil Avlu, Red Hall made out of bricks and two towers. In antiquity, it uh, looked more or less like this here, as a typical Roman imperial um, architecture. And we did a research project on parts of this complex. And we found out that um, the state of preservation, particularly of the Southern Tower was not very good. So this is the, an original Roman imperial ceiling here. This has been restored, received a new lead law in a traditional uh, Turkish Ottoman building technique. And the inner room, which is also from the Roman period, became a museum for artifacts from this monument. And some of the artifacts consist this pieces here from huge marble statues, which served as pillars in one of the courtyards and we were able to reconstruct one of these statues here and here you see the inauguration uh, ceremony. All this is able or possible thanks to a very very good and well-trained workforce we have in Bergama. Our conservation projects started already at about 1900 and there were big projects in the 1980s and the um, uh, the specialists like stonemasons which had been trained in the 80s they work now one is selimusta you can see here as uh, trainers for younger generation and uh, thanks to the gala henkel foundation we were able to do a project where let's say some educated people train more people and in what we call module three even train the population of um, these historic quarters in Bergama to preserve their own houses. Here you see um, archaeological building conservation at the Red Hall um, and here are two scenes from our excavation house where we meet with the population of the local quarter, the so-called Kalle Mahalese, in order to ask about the people about their experiences of living in these historical uh, houses, which were built by the Greek population in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, and which are wonderful houses with a, also a high touristic potential, but not easy to keep up to modern standards. And um, our idea was to support this uh, population uh, in a kind of social conservation, social and conservation project um, as part of capacity building. And we were able to train several 
jobless youngsters from this mahalle, uh, from this quarter, in first of all restoring roofs because if you want to restore a house you need to save roof um, and that was very successful so many houses are now in a much better state and what we try to do is to give support for uh, self-support that the people start to um, valorize their historical buildings much more than before and an excellent example is um, the uh, the house of Eiffel Shas uh, Mazar, which you can see here. Um, after we uh, could do in our project the roof, he and his wife um, re uh, repainted the house, a small reparations, and received a prize from the city council of. Uh, Ismir from that. And that was a, a very successful and promising project. And I hope that we continue, uh, can continue with that. Um, and we need to find sponsoring money for this, of course. Uh, not everything what I showed here can be paid from our budget, but we have several sponsors, um, both from Germany. Uh, we had the Kaplan Foundation from the United States, and we have also local sponsors from Bergama. And I would like to take the uh, opportunity to thank them for their continuous support. I would also like to thank my wonderful team. Mm, I'm only speaking here as a representative uh, of a big German, Turkish and international team. And I thank you for your patience.